Hello, this is Pastor Terry Goodman, and I want to welcome you to the Wesleyan Connection. This podcast is primarily for the clergy and laity of the Holston Annual Conference. Join with me now as I take a look around the connection and share some of the things happening in the churches of our annual conference. Good morning. This is Pastor Terry Goodman, and I want to welcome you to episode number 89 of the Wesleyan Connection. This week, I just want to share with you something that I've been thinking about the last few days. And this podcast is probably going to be geared more toward laity than it is towards the pastors of the annual conference, because as pastors of the annual conference, we will have experienced what I'm about to talk about. But the lay folk may not quite understand how it happens that a man or a woman becomes a pastor in the annual conference. And there are different levels of uh, relationship that persons have with the annual conference. And so I just want to talk about that, and I want to go back a few years. Uh, The year is 1983, and I'm a... A young man back then, much younger than I am today, and I was feeling the call into ministry, and so I spoke with a district superintendent in the Maryville district, and um, he suggested, well, actually it'd be 1982, uh, he suggested that I begin uh, the process of trying to discover whether or not I was truly called into ministry. I was assigned a a mentor. I was assigned someone to talk to, to meet with on a regular basis. Also, he was suggesting that uh, you need to go through local pastors licensing school in case there is an opportunity uh, for you to be appointed uh, should the need arise. And so I went through local pastors licensing school back in, oh, I guess, 1982 and um, into 1983. I was still in college at that point at the University of Tennessee. Didn't graduate then from UT until um, December of 83. But there was no church available to appoint me to when annual pre rolled around. And so I, I was prepared. I'd finished licensing school by then. And, of course, you had to be appointed until they actually gave you the license. But in June of 1984... After having finished seminary six months, or not seminary, undergraduate studies six months prior and working in Knoxville uh, and preparing to go into seminary in the fall of 1984, uh, the district superintendent said, we uh, would like for you to uh, serve the Walland United Methodist Church which was there in Blunt County, the county I had grown up in, just a few miles from the high school Uh, that I had attended, Heritage High School, and uh, I agreed, found out that my high school principal was a member there, that one of my high school teachers was a member there, and it was a unique dynamic for me as a, how old would I have been? Uh, Let's see, about 24-year-old to suddenly be a pastor and to suddenly have those persons that I just a few years prior had looked up to as persons that were members of my congregation. Well, needless to say, they they accepted me. I was there for the three years that I was in seminary. And during that time, you know, I was learning, not only at seminary, but learning what it meant to be the pastor of a local church through the love and the care of a congregation that took me under their wing and tried to show this young whippersnapper what it uh, I was gently guided into the ways of of serving the Lord through the local church. Well, in 1986, two years into seminary, and, and this process differs now, uh, in 1986 I entered into a relationship with the annual conference as a probationary member, and uh, I believe that at that time that's when I was would also have been ordained as a deacon, which is different than a deacon is used in in the terminology of our current uh, church setting. But I was ordained a deacon. I finished seminary 
1987, having been a probationary member already for a year now, a deacon for a year now, uh, was appointed to my uh, first charge, uh, which was an, as an associate pastor at Trinity United Methodist Church in Knoxville out on Western Avenue. Served there for a year and then was moved up the road to Withville, where in 1989 I came into full connection with the annual conference and was ordained an elder. Now those terms may or may not mean much to uh, a lay person out there. I was serving a church since 1983 all the way up until 1989 when I finally uh, received uh, the elders' orders, so to speak. And so, as far as most lay folks were concerned, I was being a pastor. Uh, I just wasn't in full connection with the annual conference, and I wasn't deemed an elder in the annual conference. Terminology that are important terms because they set down some boundaries and responsibilities for me as uh, I relate to the annual conference. The reason all this has come up in my mind is that uh, last fall I was asked to serve on the Board of Ordained Ministry. Now, I'd served on lots of boards and agencies, uh, Council on Finance and Administration. I was a statistician back in the 90s when we still calculated the apportionments for eight years. I was the one calculating your apportionment and telling you how much you needed to uh, send in each year. Um, I've served uh, on the uh, board of uh, <laughs> pensions. Uh, I've served numerous other groups along the way. But this was the first time that I'd served on the board of ordained ministry. And believe me, it, it is a difficult board to serve if for no other reason than just trying to get all the terminology down correct. And I'm still working on getting that terminology down. And I'm not even going to try to use uh, all the terms maybe in their correct way because I'm still learning exactly what it means. But this week, we had an opportunity as the Board of Ordained Ministry to meet with the men and the women that are going to be coming into full connection and become elders at this annual conference. Now you might think, oh, it's just a meeting. It's more than just a meeting. These men and women have been struggling with uh, uh, disciplinary questions and other kinds of things that they are required to do prior to being admitted, prior to being considered. You see, we were... As the Board of Ordained Ministry, we were there this week <clears throat> to see and to check their effectiveness for ministry. They had to do a project in which they tried to exemplify uh, discipleship in, in such a way in their local church setting uh, that they could be fruitful and effective. They had some rather serious questions that had to be answered. What's the nature of God? What's the nature of justification, regeneration? Um, all those lovely terms that, that you we may not ever bring out in a local church conversation, theological terms that they had to give explanation to and that we had to examine them to see if they had a right understanding of what those terms mean. And I guess I'm saying all this, especially to the lay folk out there, because I want you to understand not just anybody and everybody is allowed to become the pastor of a United Methodist Church. You are vetted along the way, all the way from local pastors licensing school through probationary periods, through... Uh, uh, the final meetings with the boards of ordained ministries. If you're a local pastor or uh, you, you're meeting with district committees on ordained ministry, there's just all different levels of membership from associate members to elders in full connections to local pastors, full-time, part-time. And these things don't just happen. There is a structure. There is an organization out there behind these men and women as they are sent to serve. 
Now, to be honest, sometimes we may not do it uh, as the way that it should be done. Sometimes we, we bring persons in that might not be as effective as they could be. But hey, that's that's life. Sometimes I'm probably not as effective as I should be. But the process says that the gifts and graces are evident in my life and that I have responded to God's call and that I'm doing what God has called me to do. And so are these men and women. Some of them are young. Some of them are a little bit older. Uh, They may be second career persons that have felt the call later in life. And so we find these men and women responding to God's call and making themselves available to serve the churches of Holston Annual Conference. As a lay folk, or as a lay person, I don't know why I like that term lay folk so much, as more than one, I guess, but as a lay person, I encourage you to understand that, that the man or woman that is your pastor is not there by accident. He or she has put themselves through a, a, a oftentimes grueling process in terms of can you imagine sitting down in front of five people as the people this week had to do and having them uh, talk with you for about an hour and 45 minutes I think is how much time we had about the things that you had submitted in written form and and look at your statements and say why do you believe this or or what was the reason that, that you did things this way can you imagine having to undergo that process well the men and women this week did I, I, the, the exact number escapes my mind but i'm thinking somewhere around a dozen cuz i think there were five groups and each group interviewed two people and so you have before you the men and women that not only feel called to ministry, but men and women that have been examined. They have been questioned. They have been probed. They have been tested. They have been put on the spot. They have come before uh, their peers, and they have uh, passed the test. They have exhibited the gifts and the graces they have shown the ability to lead and the ability to be effective in ministry and we bring them forth and present them to you at annual conference then so that you might see them and that you might know that these men and these women indeed are what the board of ordained ministry and the annual conference and the the ministers of the annual conference feel are the effective leaders of tomorrow And so I encourage you, be in prayer for your pastor. Be aware that your pastor didn't get there just because he or she one day said, you know, I think I want to get up and preach. True, they did have to say that at one point, but then it was a process from 1983 until 1989, or actually 1982, a six or seven year period for me before the first church finally said, Yes, we agree that God's gifts and graces are evident in your life. And the bishop laid his hands upon me and said, Take thou authority to preach and to teach. So pray for your pastor and appreciate what he or she has gone through to get to that stage that they can stand up before you on Sunday morning and preach and they can stand up and teach and they can visit in your home and they can share your the sacraments with you. These things have come at a price. So remember that as you seek to not only love your pastor, but as you seek to follow your pastor's lead because that's why he or she has been placed there to be God's shepherd in your church. God bless. Have a great day. And I hope to uh, have you come back and join me again next week on episode number 90 of the Wesleyan Connection. This is Pastor Goodman. Thanks for listening to this edition of the Wesleyan Connection. Be sure to check back often for more podcasts.